Good afternoon. It's Monday the 12th of January 2015. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson and Nick Green behind the IT desk. Uh, well, weather reports from across the country, uh, pretty gloomy, overcast, rainy, blustery, um, strong winds, rain, quite chilly, not looking too good. As always, those beavers been at hard at work in Siberia and we're not likely to forget them in any way. No. So um, what is the most important news at the moment? Some of you may think that it's events in France. Some of you may think it's the economy. Some of you may think it's the deaths and violence in uh, Iraq or Libya or Syria or Afghanistan. But in fact, we think it's none of those things. And we're going to start with this most important article uh, by the Daily Mail. Uh, well, here we are. Um, this is a unique article, and we are going to say this is very serious. The Daily Mail has put up an article about um, a cult which is basically sweeping through America and other countries, which means that uh, people ride on the metro, the underground. Uh, they wear upper clothing, but they only wear pants or knickers uh, below the waist. And the Daily Mail thinks that this is so important, it's actually donated uh, a total of 37, 37 photographs on uh, the Daily Mail online to this particular subject. I'm not going to show all of them because some of them are too gross, they're too horrible. But the reason we, we think this um, um, article is so important is really it is showing the level to which the general public in a variety of countries has been reduced, that they think this, so the Daily Mail describes it as a brief encounter like no other. New York strap hangers join thousands of, com of commuters across the globe, ditching their trousers to celebrate the no pants subway ride. So let's put this in context. The Daily Mail national newspaper in Britain thinks this is so important it's printed 37 photos of people wearing knickers and pants. What is really going on here is this is blatant psychological manipulation of people to see how stupid uh, you can get the most number, the greatest number of people. This is about controlling people's minds. Mm -hmm. And of course, while people are busy um, having a no pants subway ride, they're not thinking about the key issues going on around them, whether it's wars, it is uh, the state of the American economy. It's the fact people are sleeping on the streets. So do not think that because UK Column News has put that article up front, we think it's a joke. We think it's anything but a joke. This is mainstream press and media in Britain absolutely working on people's psychology, dumbing people down to the extent the most important news is people in their underpants and knickers. Quite pathetic in one degree but very very dangerous propaganda in the other it's very know how to very hard to know how to follow up on that well i think we'll follow up with reality mike and uh, what is going on in the world if you're not there with no pants or no yeah pants if you're american because that's your trousers so you're just wearing pants and knickers on the subway well uh, well done the daily mail for the best dross reporting we've seen in some time Okay, more serious stuff then. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev talking to uh, Der Spiegel over the weekend, or just on Friday, I think. Uh, and he's uh, warning, uh, they were published by Der Spiegel, as I say, uh, that the US-Russia confrontation in Ukraine uh, could well lead to a major war. I'll just quote some of the things he said. Such a war today would inevitably turn into a nuclear war. If someone loses their nerve because of the acrimonious atmosphere, we will not survive the coming year. I'm not saying this lightly. This is truly the, of the utmost concern to me. And he goes on to say uh, that it's a pretty serious situation, the loss of trust between Russia and the West. He's calling it catastrophic. He's saying, uh, you know, he's talking about the, the uh, expansion of NATO uh, on the Western borders of Russia and saying that no head of the Kremlin could ignore such a thing. Uh, and suggesting that uh, the US is trying to establish a mega empire. Uh, and so, and they finished off by saying, uh, 
the new, uh, he, he's talking about Germany, he's saying the new Germany wants its hands in every pie. There seem to be a lot of people who want to be involved in, the new, in a new division of Europe. Germany had already tried to expand its influence of power towards the east in World War II. Does it really need another lesson? And I think that's, that does it really need another lesson is a pretty uh, significant statement, really. Do we need another lesson? It seems like we do in some, some respects. Well, I think we're likely to get it if, uh, if um, David Cameron and his uh, Lib Lamb corn carry on. Yeah. Um, well, um, have a look from another direction. So while we've got the, uh, the uh, dire comments um, by Gorbachev there, uh, we've got this um, article here in the Daily Telegraph. German army must promote more women generals. Not enough female generals in the German army, laments the country's defence minister. So um, what did this lady had to have to say? Well, she said there's, there at the moment, there's only one, i.e. one general, there's only one general uh, in the history of the Bundeswehr. This is a lousy proportion, so we have to consider quotas with clear timelines. So this is nothing on, um, this is nothing about performance. This is not, nothing about the right person for the job. This is about a woman defense minister coming in and saying, well, the solution is we need more women, so we're gonna have a quota, but it gets worse because if we get into the article, it goes on to say this. In, in, uh, in the paramedics, the military pa paramedics, obviously we have just as many young women doctors as young men doctors. But at the top of the army, we have almost no women. I think men are not per se more brutal, radical and warlike than women. And then she goes on. Military service no longer depends on physical strength, uh, but also on mental health, technical skills and leadership. Now, there is some amazing language in this uh, coming out of this this lady here. So first of all, we've got the fact that uh, the drive is effectively to create women who are as um, brutal as men. Mm. So reversal of the roles here. We're going to get more women into the army. She's very happy with that because, of course, women, according to her, can be as brutal as men. Uh, I didn't bother to pick up on one of the articles that is a brilliant new book talking about uh, Ravensbrück concentration camp and the fact that uh, the brutality there was carried out by women guards. But here's the, the uh, German defence minister and she uses this very key term, mental health. Uh, you've got to have the right mental health to be in the uh, German armed forces. Now, the significance of this for me is this takes us straight into Brock Chisholm and the fact that you are only mentally healthy uh, if you are going to obey what governments say, if you are going to obey essentially what the United Nation policy is. So uh, I think this woman is giving you a very clear message that the German armed forces are to be absolutely politicised and not only are, is there going to be a campaign to get more women in uh, simply on the basis, basis of diversity, um, you're only going to be serving in the German armed forces if your mental health is OK, i.e. you simply follow everything the government says. Mm. But the article also po points out um, there are huge uh, weaknesses at, at the moment in the German armed forces. Large numbers of tanks are out of service, large numbers of, com of, co of combat aircraft are out of service. Uh, so the article is also pointing out that the German military uh, is uh, suffering huge problems at the moment, which is remarkable as uh, supposedly we're supposed to have a, an increased defence budget by NATO as NATO gets more aggressive uh, towards the uh, Eastern Front. Mm. Well, of course, if we need somebody to um, sort matters out, um, probably comes back to our king. King David himself, he's come up, it really has, we have entered the silly season as we head towards the election and uh, he's coming off with such nonsense, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, we've got people being arrested uh, and uh, given community service for shouting at this man. I feel like shouting at him myself. Well, he's obviously getting very frightened, Mike, if somebody heckles you from the crowd and, and uh, you know what you're really involved in. That's quite scary. I, th I think it is a sign these people are getting pretty twitched. Yes. They're being rumbled. Yes. But anyway, <laughs> he said uh, parents and grandparents must look at the children they love 
and save them from a legacy of huge debts. And they've got to do that by voting conservative at the next election. So he's saying, he's, this is a speech, he's, I'm not sure whether he's given it yet today, but it's, he's giving this speech today. Uh, he's saying that uh, uh, the very stuff that makes life work living, worth living will be put at risk if, uh, if Britain fails to uh, deal with the budget deficit. Or the, 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 yeah, the budget deficit. Uh, and he's uh, going to outline the six key themes at the heart of uh, the Tory manifesto for the coming election, and that's tackling the deficit, jobs, taxes, homeownership, education and retirement and no mention of uh, the National Health Service. And he says, uh, he's gonna say in this speech, uh, nothing we want to achieve will be possible unless we eliminate our deficit and deal with our debts. The security of your families depends on the stability of our public finances. To every mother, father, grandparent, uncle, aunt, I would ask this question. When you look at the children you love, do you want to land them with a legacy of huge debts? Do you want to limit their future? to make life more difficult for their generation because we refuse to do the right thing in our generation. Well, let's just look and see uh, what the five years of the LibCon has done. Um, here we go, with government debt uh, over the last five years, obviously projected forward into 2015. These are treasury figures. Uh, so, um, of course, this, bad as enough as it is, uh, doesn't mention the unfunded liabilities, which we've been talking about at the UK column for several years now mainly pensions, four and a half trillion pounds, black hole in the state pension pot, the same for the public pension pot. Uh, and, uh, and of course, today they're announcing that only 45% uh, of people are going to get the full payout of state pension in the, uh, with the, when the new regime comes in, uh, in April. Uh, so in order to asset strip pensioners with, uh, that's for state pensioners, but in order to asset strip pensioners with uh, private pensions, then of course they need a new system there as well. Uh, and uh, so they also need to sucker pensioners into investing in risky areas, or possibly even just uh, set up a bank of mum and dad for their children. So this is pension wise, and it's gonna be a free and impartial service, they say, uh, in order to help people understand their choices uh, when this new pension regime comes into place and basically uh, you will be allowed to spend your pension pot on whatever you like. Um, so they're going to tell you what you can spend it on, uh, the different types of pension that are available, and what's tax-free and what isn't. And of course, uh, I'm quite sure that the housing market is going to get the, the benefit of a boost from this. But equally, we're going to see pensioners uh, investing in uh, things which end up losing money. So um, more diversion of private money into, into you know, money which has been saved uh, over decades into, into private corporations and so on. Yeah, deliberate so, stuff. Absolutely. We've got a fantastic, the silly season has begun. Uh, we're, we're heading into the election and it's so, clearly going to be one of the best election campaigns yeah, ever. Vote Conservative if you, if you want more trouble, you want more debt, you want more wars overseas. The decision is pretty easy. Just vote Conservative. Well, actually, the, you'll get Lib Dem as well because they're hovering in the background. But and Labour. Don't hang back. Vote for these people um, if you want smaller pensions, your children to suffer more wars overseas. Makes sense. Uh, well, we can stay on the case of uh, David Cameron because, of course, he's been rushing over to France uh, to pledge um, loyalty to the French to commiserate with the, uh, the deaths and the recent terrorist atrocities. Um, so a lot of reporting across all the papers. We've got a, um, a tweet here that he's had a full briefing from security chiefs. Uh, we've discussed ensuring the UK is properly protected from the terrorist threat. We've had buildings in London uh, covered up with um, um, French uh, with lights reflecting the French flag. We've we've uh, poured millions into solidarity with the French. Um, of course, uh, the French now deploying thousands of police to defend Jewish schools, I think, as a result of the, uh, um, the supermarket incident. Um, my question is, where were the French government when we were having terrorist atrocities in Britain and multiple deaths in bombing incidents in cities, not only in Northern Ireland, but in Britain? Did we see any sign of uh, French... Uh, um, politicians coming over to Britain. I don't think we did. So there's something going on under under this, in my opinion, Mike. Uh, we've got this drive to, to we've got the police having um, silence to uh, uh, show solidarity with their French counterparts. I think we've got a big propaganda machine working 
to try and push Britain and France together as though we are lifelong friends. Mm. What do you think? I don't think it's just limited to Britain and France, but we'll, we might come we'll on to a bit of this later on. Okay. Well, we just thought we would uh, remind viewers of some of the things that uh, UK Column exclusively has been warning about. And uh, let's have a look at Cameron here. Uh, we said to understand David Cameron's treason against the United Kingdom and our armed forces, uh, you've got to read the Franco-British Council plan, which is effectively, was effectively to destroy Britain's military capability. And it was only the UK column that asked the questions as to what a so-called charity was doing, having secret meetings which was in advance of Britain's strategic defence review, which then re results in David Cameron announcing to the nation out of nowhere, with no debate in Westminster, that we're going to have a 50-year military partnership with the French. So to my mind, events in France, we'll take it at face value at the moment. Uh, a lot of people are uh, pretty unsure about what really happened. Uh, we will say... OK, so a terrorist event has happened in France. Why have we got this massive uh, propaganda push uh, to try and say that almost, um, you know, Britain and France in bed with each other? Uh, well, let's not forget um, Mr. Nick Clegg. And uh, he's been speaking out on radio, of course, as he likes to do. You notice in the two shots that we've shown, David Cameron, I thought he was looking quite gay in his uh, little neck scarf there in front of the window and his, his hair neatly done. And then, of course, we've got Nick Clegg, no tie, because he's being one of the people, he's being relaxed, he's one of us. Uh, but my goodness, he was hammering um, Nigel Farage and basically saying, well, it was outrageous that Nigel Farage had dared to talk about it, immigration. So we just like to remind people here that uh, we've got Nick Clegg, unelected Deputy Prime Minister, Europhile, mentored by Leon Britton, unaccountable President of the Privy Council. I think he still is. Yes. And um, he gives uh, Nigel Farage a hard time because Nigel Farage dares to make some comments about immigration. But uh, let's have a look at this because this was Julia Middleton's book, Beyond Authority, Leadership in a Changing World. So the political charity... Common Purpose, Chief Executive Julia Middleton. Let's remind people what this lady was saying several years ago. Uh, she was saying that we can change the country by setting up useful idiots. Uh, we could use expert idiots, uh, university professors, so-called advisors to government. Uh, we should be building coalitions and conspiring to change the system to the new model. These are Julia Middleton's words in her book, not mine. And she said very clearly that uh, any opponents of what they were trying to do, we just run over them, undermine them, go round them or discredit them. But she also said this, that uh, the aim was to get two or three determined fifth columnists on the inside. So there is the direct... Um, um, comment on the use of fifth columnists but let's remind ourselves it was Nigel Farage who actually said we have I'm afraid and mercifully it's small uh, but we do have a fifth column within our countries so Nigel Farage indicating on what had been happening in France but of course the big lie is to move the debate on to a threat from immigrants when we know that we've got uh, political subversion and a fifth column operating in our own country and the woman's even telling us what they're doing. Yep. So is this part of it? Uh, because we've got a nice headline here from the Daily Mail um, saying that uh, Prince Charles, well, he's been a bit of a, he's been a bit silly really because he's been having ISIS products in his shop. Um, it's all a bit of a ghastly mistake. Uh, just happens to be announced at the exact time that we're beginning to ramp up. So I'm, I'm saying, is this a mistake by Prince Charles or is this the royal family also getting involved in politics to ramp up the rhetoric for the clash of civilizations? And if it isn't Prince Charles, then uh, we've got to look no further than Fox News uh, because they've used a... Well, that's Rupert Murdoch, isn't it? Uh, indeed, yeah. Mm. 
So um, they've used the so-called expert who said, well, Bur uh, <coughs> excuse me, Birmingham is totally Muslim. Uh, in Britain, it's not just no-go zones. There are actual cities like Birmingham that are totally Muslim where non-Muslims just simply don't go in. Well, of course, utter nonsense, but nevertheless pushed out primetime American TV. And uh, we're going to ask the same question. Is this ramping up the rhetoric uh, to help a clash of civilizations um, or is it just deliberately inaccurate reporting? This stuff cannot be accidental. No. And we're seeing we're seeing this massive push at the moment to distort people's perception of what the news is. So UK Columns has been warning and warning about this uh, propaganda. Um, so uh, one of our front pages here. And uh, what, what are we saying? That uh, a, um, a Photoshop job there, obviously, we've got a face which is half David Cameron and half Clegg. Uh, but we're warning about treason uh, between uh, the British military and the French. Uh, we're talking about um, squaddies dying to protect the opium crops. Uh, we've got uh, British students drowning in debt. Uh, we've got public spending EU budget. But this was one of the core things that we warned and warned about. And that was the fact that the British Cabinet Office was collaborating with French brainwashing teams in order to change the way we think. So whatever we are seeing and reading in the mainstream news, whatever we're seeing coming out of Westminster, the hard fact is that they are using applied psychology to change the way we see the world. Indeed. Well, we've got to come back to King David again. Well, I think it's ideal because we can have a look at his draft. I think he's looking just so... I think he's Dabber looking there. lovely here. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe... He, what is it? Pink News that does the awards, <laughs> don't they? I think David our King Cameron is is in for an award. So as you said, he tweeted out earlier that he had had a full briefing from security chiefs and he went on to say that the UK is facing uh, the same threat, as talking about France, from fanatical from a fanatical death cult of Islamist extremist violence. And I just wondered exactly what that death cult was about. Um, because, of course, uh, uh, he uh, is using this cynically as an excuse uh, to push through this communications bill, this Snoopers Charter. Uh, he's also using it to justify uh, further uh, and in fact, in, Fran in France as well, as you already mentioned, we've got thousands of police, uh, thousands of military now coming onto the streets of, of France. So on both both sides of the uh, of the channel, we're seeing this being rather cynically used uh, to uh, push forward um, the sort of uh, 1984 agenda. Um, and uh, he says he's going to legislate accordingly. We've demonstrated in the last two or three minutes that this relationship with the French goes back a few years uh, yeah. and it's being driven. Uh, and so this, uh, whatever is going on in with uh, surrounding Charlie Hebdo, um, it is being used by the the uh, the group of the G7 leaders that were all there in Paris, uh, arm in arm, showing their solidarity. I don't think mm. there was much solidarity between what was going through their minds and the million people that were standing behind them. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's an Islamic um, extremist death cult, apparently, according to um, Mr. Cameron. Yes. Um, shall I bring in this gentleman? I think you should. Well, let's have a look at one of the Islamic um, death cult people. Well, here he is. Um, well, of course, it's uh, Foreign Secretary, as was William Hague. And we just like to remind people that this is the man who was trying to alter the rules to allow weapons to be sent into Syrian rebels. Uh, so we've got conservatives and, of course, Lib Dem and Labour people working to stoke up the violence. Uh, we've already had a go at um, um, Iraq. Uh, we've had a go at um, Libya. Libya and Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan. And here we are uh, having another go at Syria. So this was Western politicians, British politicians, stoking up the violence. But according to David Cameron, uh, well, it's all a result of uh, Muslim and Islamic extremists. Uh, well, we couldn't fail to bring in... Um, uh, Tony Blair. I was surprised he wasn't there, actually, in Paris. I think he might be worried about his own safety, do you mm. think? Possibly. Uh, possibly somebody might not like him. Well, here we've got Tony Blair. He's um, wearing the white of a virgin, or is it for a Christ-like effect amongst the troops? 
Um, but uh, who's defending him? Well, it was William Hague who was saying to the cabinet, uh, the 10th anniversary is coming up. Uh, we don't want to be mentioning the Iraq war. So the Lib Lab con puppet show for the British public. Uh, what are all these politicians involved in ramping up war and violence overseas? And then we're going to turn around and uh, blame it on the uh, on uh, the Muslims. Uh, well, here he is, Tony Blair, mastermind of the Iraq war on the absolute lie of weapons of mass destruction. And um, what was going on? Well, of course, we're talking about death and um, very large numbers of people dying as a result of lies by British politicians who claim they're Christians, interestingly enough. And of course, it's not only civilians that uh, died, uh, but we've got to remember all of the um, military who've not only died, but lost limbs on the battlefield. And uh, what are we talking about? Well, we're not talking about 20 people in France. Uh, here's a mixture of statistics about the number of deaths in Iraq. Uh, so we've, we've got figures ranging from uh, 110,000 to uh, 600,000. So statistics totally inaccurate, but we know that they are in very large numbers. Uh, are we really talking about a fanatical Islamic um, death cult or are we actually looking at British politicians who started the mess in the first place? Uh, and continue to fund it, in fact. Indeed, yeah. And of course, they're smiling while they do it. So pretty appropriate picture by uh, of William Hague. Uh, if you feel that we're being pretty tough and cynical today, we are, because uh, as we watch events unfold, we're just into the middle of January, and uh, already we can see this government clamping down on free speech. We've got uh, special forces units being put on the streets to work alongside the police. Uh, we've got thousands of French police who are actually military. That's the basis of uh, the French police system. They're military. They're coming onto the streets. Um, we've got an unfolding dictatorship. OK. Complete change of subject then, mortgage fraud. And this is a top Greater Manchester police officer, according to the Manchester Evening News here, who is on in court at the moment on charges related to mortgage fraud. So what has he done? Uh, well, what he did was that he uh, bought a farm, a small farm, three acres, a very small farm, basically a farmhouse uh, with his wife, and then subsequently got divorced. He ended up keeping the, the property and took out a 185,000 pound mortgage uh, and uh, as he spent part of that money, I think about £30,000, refurbishing some of his property with a view to letting it out uh, on hol for holiday lets. He's still living at the property, though, in the meantime. Uh, and the, uh, the mortgage company decided to take him to court uh, through the CPS for mortgage fraud uh, on the basis that uh, he had taken the loan without declaring that it was going to be used for commercial purposes and therefore he was accessing a cheaper interest rate. Um, well... Um, I don't really like to support Greater Manchester police officers because you know we've seen what they were doing at Barton Moss and so on. But on the other hand, this has got to be the most ridiculous case of uh, sheer hypocrisy on behalf of the banks, uh, and uh, because they are just committing fraud hand over fist with regard to mortgages, they have been for a number of decades. Uh, the terms of the mortgage, people say that uh, uh, well, people you know we all enter into if we take out a mortgage, we all enter enter into the, that agreement and we should pay it back and so on, and indeed we should, uh, but uh, only if the terms of the mortgage are fully declared and if the banks aren't in the meantime uh, manipulating interest rates uh, to make sure that uh, you are paying more than you need to pay. Uh, so sheer hypocrisy in the, in the case of the banks here, and we'll just say that um, at the conference in, uh, on the 1st of March, um, we, will, we expect 90% chance that Mr Ebert uh, Guy Taylor's uh, colleague is going to be speaking about fraudulent documentation and specifically about mortgage fraud. Um, and uh, so that's going to be a particularly interesting uh, discussion. If for, for whatever reason he is not able to be there, we will have alternative arrangements and made. In other, in other words, his presentation will be given uh, by somebody else. 
Um, but uh, um, Mr. Ebert, very keen to come and do this, and we suggest everybody comes and listens, listens to that because uh, we believe that he has uh, he is saying that there was something in the region, was it 45,000 uh, uh, evictions last 47. year? 47,000 evictions last year, uh, and he believes that he can demonstrate that about 90% of those were fraudulent. Um, so a very significant uh, uh, part of that. Uh, also just to like to remind people while we're uh, doing the sort of uh, plugs, of Alex G's uh, launch party on the 29th of January at Waterstones in Peterborough. Uh, please go to that if you would like to, but if you are going to uh, attend that, please uh, email launch at alexg.com beforehand because he'll have uh, drinks and nibbles and just wants to make sure everybody is accommodated. All right. Okay. So massive mortgage fraud, my key to stopping it is for people to see how it's done. And of course, this is where uh, um, uh, to be able to understand the fraudulent documents, um, see to actually see these documents is a, is, is a key part of it. Well, we were speaking to Mr. Ebert this morning and he is really, really keen that this issue becomes an election issue. Now, the focus of this conference is that the subjects that we talk about, we're asking everybody that attends to go out and take those out and make those election issues. Uh, and this is one that, that if you feel inclined, you feel particularly motivated by this issue, then then we're going to give you the tools to go out and make this an election issue. That's the point. Absolutely. So talking of elections, um, jumps over the pond, I think. Yes. Well, of course, next year is the presidential election. And uh, well, we have uh, two people uh, very likely to declare their candidacies in the not too distant future, uh, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. And I just wanted to highlight this uh, fantastic article on, uh, uh, on RT, suggest people go and read this talking about a bit of the history. They're mainly focusing on the history of the Bush family, but they do mention the Clintons as well. Uh, really, are we about to see a Bush-Clinton uh, dynastic battle is what they're talking about. Uh, and they're highlighting some of the things. Glad, good to see it appearing in the mainstream press. RT's close to mainstream, I suppose. Uh, discussing the, uh, the Bush family's uh, legacy of uh, financing the uh, Hitler regime and, and the, the money that went from through Prescott Bush, which is Jeb Bush's grandfather, sorry, uh, yeah, grandfather, uh, mm. through Fr Fritz Thyssen and the Union Banking Corporation uh, into uh, particularly German steel and a lot of that money and that uh, steel production uh, being used for uh, developing Germany's war capability. Um, so uh, RT covering that and really sort of mm. saying, what kind of people are we uh, looking to elect? Uh, in the States. Some particularly fine documentaries on H Hillary Clinton on YouTube. Uh, one of them's about uh, one hour, 43 minutes long. A lot of information, having a look at uh, fi uh, financial background, what's happened to supporters, and certainly what's happened to people who've challenged the Clinton dynasty. Uh, interesting that, that it's described there as equivalent to Game of Thrones. So what is this, a recognition that the uh, the political system is an absolute game, it's mm. theatre. Absolute theatre, yeah. To keep us occupied. Okay, and uh, moving on then, uh, TTIP, uh, the, uh, the uh, tr Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, but European Union has now published um, proposals for, uh, for the next stage um, and for, in the negotiations with the United States. Uh, there's been quite a bit uh, on TTIP in the alternative media, very little in the mainstream media about the dangers of it. Um, but the EU Trade Commissioner Cecilia Milstrom, Milstrom actually, uh, is uh, uh, saying that she is delighted that we can start a new year by clearly demonstrating through our actions the commitment we made to greater transparency just over a month ago. Today's publication of our specific legal pr uh, proposals in the context of TTIP uh, marks an, uh, another first in the EU trade policy. Uh, so one of the things that they don't uh, go into, however, is the uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement arrangements. Um, so, sorry, um, I do apologize. I've lost track of where I was going with that. Um, but basically uh, they, they go as far as uh, intergovernment uh, Whenever there's a dispute between between governments, they go as far as that, but they don't go as they, they don't detail the the disputes between corporations and governments. And this is the area that many people are particularly concerned about because obviously um, this trade agreement potentially uh, makes it possible for for corporations to take governments to court yeah. uh, and attempt to bankrupt governments, and that, that's clearly a, 
the, the issue of sovereignty. But dangerous. Is absolutely dangerous. Step, step forward. Yeah. Well, um, are we going to get truth in the media? Well, this is an interesting little uh, Facebook post. Uh, this is from the uh, Foreign Office News on Burma Facebook page. Uh, and what they say is uh, that uh, the UK has, fun has funded a media workshop make, um, for making a free and fair election. So the UK is now funding a media workshop in Burma, Burma which is with the direct intention of getting involved in the upcoming election. Uh, on the importance of media freedom for making a free and fair election, the workshop uh, has been organised by Article 19, with funding provided from the by the British Embassy. Uh, and there's a quote there. Now, I was interested in finding out who Article 19 is. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, um, Article 19 is an, is an, an NGO, of course, uh, and who are its... Um, Trustees, well, so look, a non-government organisation. A non-government or yeah. organisation. They um, are, are envisaging a world where people are free to speak their opinions, participate in decision making, making informed choices about their lives. Um, so this is all about press freedom, basically, which yeah. I thought was particularly ironic. But we'll come on to why that might be in a second. Um, press freedom. So who are the uh, trustees? Well, look who's first here. We've got head of special projects, policy and strategy of the BBC. Uh, we've got. Uh, free speech campaigners, but the BBC is there, okay. And who funds this organisation? Well, the Department for International Aid, uh, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the European Commission, the Ford Foundation, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Frit Ord, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Open Society Institute, so that'll be George Soros then, uh, uh, Swedish International Development Cooperation Industry and the, uh, sorry, Agency and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And this is all to help Burma have uh, free, fair elections? Well, not just Burma, because actually in March, I think it was, sorry, May, uh, they were attempting to um, have a World Press Freedom Day in Tunisia because they all thought right. the Tunisian uh, people needed free press following the Tunisia, to Tunisian uh, uh, revolution there, if you want to call we, it that. We normally bomb people to make them free. Do, do you think there's a mix-up of language here? Is uh, Tunisia next? Are they is, going to get a bit of Libya treatment? No, I think this is just a different approach. They've sent right. the BBC Media Action in. and Oh, BBC Media Action? Charity. Uh, sorry, I meant uh, article, article 19. Did I say BBC Media Action? You said BBC. Ah, yeah. yes, they're partners. All right, so, so, so um, well, this is getting very complex now. So we've got a BBC charity called BBC Media Action that boasts of its involvement in the affairs of overseas country. It's boasted that it's been um, helping the opposition in Syria, uh, boasting that it's been able to do it by getting in amongst people and changing the way the system works. Most people will call that subversion. And um, this is not BBC... Uh, public. This is not BBC, the profit-making company. This is a BBC charity that's uh, helping people become democratic. Right, so this is a, now another charity called Article 19, which has as its first trustee a BBC, yeah. member of the BBC, its partnership with BBC Media Action, funded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and they're going into countries uh, to discuss media freedom with a view to elections. Right. Why don't they come into this country so that well, I was just going to come on to that because I just wanted to highlight Patrick's, Patrick's fantastic article on 21st century war, je suis hypocrite. Please go and read this uh, because, as he's pointing out, over the weekend we saw David Cameron in Paris uh, protesting arm in arm for press freedom uh, and freedom of speech with his other G7 club members plus a couple of others. Uh, and this is the same David Cameron who quite happily, who was quite happy to make a serious attempt at shutting down freedom of the press in this country while Article 19 and the BBC Media Action and the Foreign Office work hand in hand, very hard hand in hand, to promote uh, press freedom in other countries. Um, so what they want, of course, is not press freedom at all, neither here nor abroad. Uh, what they want is the freedom to push their propaganda into the press uh, without any opposition. Yeah, it's all pretty clear, isn't it? Yes. Um, it's a set of rules for people overseas, do as we say, um, but... Um Back home, it's going to be completely different. What is happening in Britain at the moment with regard to free press? Well, let's remind ourselves, because uh, here we are, uh, from the Press Gazette, uh, they were reporting uh, that at least 59 UK journalists had been arrested since April 
2011. Can't quite read the date on that, but the point is that here we are in Britain, home of uh, free speech, common law and justice. Th this and, is the country uh, where the BBC is criticising Israel, or sorry, um, Egypt for uh, arresting journalists. Yeah, well, you criticise other people and bomb them if they don't do as you say, but at the home... You just get on and do what you want to do. So UK arresting journalists and trying them and, of course, putting them in prison. And let's remind ourselves of the heart of the drive for state control of British media. It was Common Purpose, uh, Sir David Bell, uh, the creation of the Media Standards Trust. And of course, it was the UK column alone that warned and warned about the insidious nature of Common Purpose not only for subversion and a fifth column, but also to take control of the press. And of course, we have to show you this uh, very nice photograph of the chief executive, Julia, Julia Middleton, here she is. And this organisation working flat out to get its man, uh, Sir David Bell, at the heart of the Leveson inquiry in order to give the government draconian powers over the press uh, and media. Well, luckily, not everyone swallowed it, and uh, uh, several of the mainstream um, newspapers reported. We happen to have one of the little diagrams from the Sun here, but the Telegraph reported, the Mail reported, the Guardian reported, and it did seem that a few people woke up to what was actually happening. But welcome to UK in 2015. Uh, we've got special forces on the streets with the police, uh, we've got the government pushing for greater powers to monitor our emails, private phone calls, etc. And of course, in the background, we've still got these insidious, subversive organisations such as Common Purpose working for state control of the press. Uh, but credit where it's due. And uh, we just like to uh, give you this little snippet from Guido Fawkes. Uh, now, what, uh, what he picked up on was what Hacked Off had been up to. Let's remind ourselves, Hacked Off was spawned out of the Media Standards Trust, uh, essentially the same organisation, but they like to say, well, we're at arm's length. Um, both of them connected into the main man, Sir David Bell. He was the man who campaigned for a Leveson-type inquiry, and then once that was set up, simply hopped out of common purpose and media standards to become a senior panel man, uh, member for Leveson. Uh, we've got some other big names associated with it. Roger Grief here, temporary chair of the Media Standards Trust, uh, founding board member of Channel 4, chief executive of Channel 4. He's all independent person. Or if you want to go in a different direction, good old Hugh Grant. Um, he got very upset, of course, because um, uh, there were reports of his um, night out with a young lady in the back of a car. Uh, but we've also got uh, insidious people like these two, Will Moy from Full Fact and Martin Moore from the Media Standards Trust, who gave evidence to Leveson but claimed they were totally independent. Uh, nice system if you can get it. I think Burma should adopt this system yes. because clearly it's transparent. But what did Guido Fawkes pick up on? Well, he picked up on the fact that the Advertising Standards Authority uh, had ruled against <coughs> Hacked Off. And this was over an advert they had to do with the Leveson inquiry and the resulting charter. And on the left of your screen, this is what they said. However, uh, we considered the strong suggestion of Leveson's involvement in the Royal Charter alongside a conflicting statement regarding the indirect influence of Leveson's public inquiry recommendations on the Royal Charter provided consumers with confusing and ambiguous statements regarding the nature of any involvement of Leveson in the Royal Charter. As a result of this ambiguous information, we concluded that the hacked off advertisement was likely to mislead. The ad breached CAP code edition 12 rules 3.1 and 3.3. It was misleading advertising. So the very group who campaigned for open upstanding and trustworthy media have just been uh, quite rightly pulled apart for misleading the public. Mm. Um, I think we should export them to Burma is, is, is the thing to do. So let's remind ourselves of, um, of this. We've been reporting on Nesta 
And thank you very much to the viewer who said, UK column, you've missed something. And what we missed was that Jeff Morgan is actually the chief executive of Nesta. Now, remember that he comes from a background of Demos, a uh, Marxist spawned organisation. And um, what's uh, Mr. Morgan good at? Well, reframing the British public. Uh, so here we are. We were talking about the behavioural insights team were working inside government, inside number 10, hand in glove with the cabinet office, now a private company, well, owned by the government and, of course, also owned by Nesta. And we identified the good people involved with Nesta, including uh, Rothschild bankers, totally independent, of course. But let's put him in at the top of the tree. Here he is, Jeff Mulgan. And let's remember what this gentleman was involved with. Uh, he was chief executive of the Young Foundation from 1997 to 2004. That's the Young Foundation that puts money into every one of these reframing projects. Yes, indeed. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They've got our best interests at heart, yeah. though, Mike, so don't, don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, but uh, Mr. Mulgan, uh, working for the government from 1997 to 2004, um, government, um, uh, sorry, director of government strategy unit, uh, head of um, the uh, Prime Minister's office, that should, police should not be in there, sorry, it should be just uh, head of Prime Minister's office. And of course, his background is, is as a director of Demos, which was created from a Marxist background. But he was also formerly chief advisor to Gord Gordon Brown, uh, a lecturer in telecommunications. He's very big on investment. Uh, he knows about that. Of course, he's been in the BBC, BBC reporter, visiting professor at the London School of Economics, UCL, Melbourne, and also China executive leadership advisor. Uh, so he's uh, busy there helping the Chinese to run their country. Um, no better person in China than uh, Jeff Morgan. And he's an advisor to governments. So why should we be watching this man? Well, let's come back to the UK columns um, behavioural change network diagram. Uh, where was Mr. Mulgan? Well, here he is. Uh, let's bring him further into the picture. Uh, this is the man mixing with the Young Foundation. He's involved with Common Purpose, of course. Uh, Charles Landry, well worth having a look at. Uh, remaking uh, charity in the 21st century. Presumably mm -hmm. that's politicising charities. And he's involved with the Foreign Policy Centre. And if anybody's in doubt as to his links with Common Purpose, here we've got a Common Purpose document boasting of the 10th anniversary conference, 17th of April 2000. Guest speakers, Julia Middleton. Here we are, trustee and member of Demos's advisory council. And underneath, we've got Jeff Morgan, also starting a, a co-founder of Demos in 1993 with Martin Jacks former editor of Marxism today. Mm -hmm. So should we be concerned that we've got a Marxist um, buried at the heart of government changing our behavior? I'd say so, but David Cameron doesn't think so. So we'll end on a warning we've consistently given. Let's come back to Tony Blair, uh, who said in 2000 this, the Prime Minister has a vision of a new Britain. Central to this vision is the creation of a new class, a new elite, placed in positions of authority who will propagate the new spirit of the age and spread the principles of the third way across Britain. So there we are. For any overseas countries that want a fine model of de democracy, look, f look no further than Britain and David Cameron just ignore the wars and uh, arrest of journalists. Yes. So we'll leave you on that happy note. Uh, we will just say that tomorrow, the 13th, Robert Green will be appearing in court in Aberdeen. I believe the case should start at 10 o'clock. Uh, if any people north of the border can get there to give Robert support and to see justice being done, we'd encourage them to go. And I also understand that tomorrow, uh, sorry, on Wednesday the 14th at 2 o'clock there is a very interesting conference on child abuse in Westminster. Uh, we'll try and give you some more details of that tomorrow. Uh, but isn't it noticeable that as the events in France have ramped up, 
So we're hearing less, less and less. less about child abuse uh, by uh, senior government ministers and, of course, deaths of children apparently linked to British politicians. So all of that being nicely buried by the bad news of France. Mm. We'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Rerun of the news at 2100 tonight. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.